Tech stocks are in investors' minds right now, given how poorly the sector's performed over the last one year. And, and so we invited Sonu Chawla to get her perspective on things. Sonu is a director, partner, and portfolio manager at Time for Capital, which manages the Steady Hand Global Small Cap Equity Fund. And Sonu has been covering tech stocks for over two decades and has a great fundamental understanding on what impacts these businesses today. It's one of a few conversations we had with our partners at Time for Capital on the issues that you've told us are on your mind. This one on tech, but we also spoke to them about Europe, given the, the war and the energy crisis the region is experiencing, China, Asia emerging markets. And we also spoke to Magnus Larson, who's the lead manager of the Steady Hand Global Small Cap Equity Fund, to get his take on how he's positioned the fund, given the world we find ourselves in today. Now, I should point out that if you've got other investment questions, you should register for our monthly live Straight Talk with Steady Hand sessions. Now, it's called that because you can literally ask us any investment question on your mind, and we'll do our best to address it. We'll leave a link in the description. And with that, I'll leave you to my conversation with Sonu. Hey, Sonu, how are you? Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me here. I mean, you've been covering technology sector for as you know long as anyone else, and it's a really interesting market out there. I think you'll agree with that. It's uh, There's a lot of carnage out there. It's gone from being the market darling, the technology sector that is, has gone from being the market darling darling to being public enemy number one right now. And there's really two schools of thought out there, right? There's one school of thought out there that says, hey, this might be a good time to start investing in the sector. And there's this other school of thought out there that says, no, this is going to be another lost period like it was after the tech bubble burst. So I'd love to get your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, no, tech is definitely a battleground right now, because as you correctly pointed out, that has seen the maximum amount of drawdowns we've seen in the market across the board from big tech to small cap and software and semiconductors and all in between. What I would say is that the tech companies today are in a much healthier shape than they were during the dot-com bubble or even during the Great Recession. We have a larger cohort of of software companies in the marketplace today that are largely recurring revenue business models instead of, you know, perpetual license one and done type of business models in decades past. And while the multiples have contracted, and that's largely a function of the rising 10-year yield government yields, which are now at 4.2, 4.3% as we speak, and the multiples have contracted, reflecting the higher cost of capital. But I do think that the value proposition of the tech companies is as strong as it was five years ago. And for example, let's take a look at software companies, right? Software companies trade at five times next 12 month revenues versus the last 10 year average of eight times revenues. And that's because the 10-year yield has gone up from 2.2% over the last decade to 4.2%. So for every 1% increase in yield, the multiples contract by roughly 15%. So on that basis, you could make the argument that the software space in general is probably fairly valued. But at the same time, there is less visibility on 2023 numbers because you know, monetary policy works with a lag. So there are increasing fears of a recession in 2023. And as a result, analysts in general and company managements have less visibility into what 2023 will bring from a macroeconomic standpoint. And as a result, there is risk to the top line estimates. Multiples have contracted. And once we get better visibility, that may be the time to you know, get more constructive on on software names, for example. It's the same thing in semiconductor. We're going through downward estimate revisions. And once we see estimate revisions spread from PCs and phones to all kinds of technology like cloud computing, that's when these names become more viable and easier to own. But at this point, it's just a function of waiting for that to happen. So, so how has that impacted private markets? Because technology companies for the last few years have, you know, have raised a lot of capital in private markets. And instead of going public, they've stayed private and enjoyed some of the higher valuations. We've seen these big numbers being bandied around around 
about how much they're worth. So how has that impacted private markets today? Yeah, no, I actually think a great time to be a public market investor over a private market investor, because I think private companies have and private valuations have enjoyed an illiquidity premium. But as the public comps have corrected, it's been become easier to actually attract talent to come work for a public company because a lot of these companies give stock comp uh, and stock, stock options to their employees. And as the stocks have corrected, it's easier to come work for a public market company than a private company because those valuations, we haven't seen the resets in the valuations of the private market. I'll give you a couple of examples in the software space, right? You have this whole ride sharing and delivery services group. So if you think of an Uber and DoorDash, the multiples there have contracted tremendously, 75% in case of uh, DoorDash. But if you look at Instacart, which is looking to go public, it was initially valued at $39 billion. They marked it down to $24 billion internally and then down to $13 billion. So you're seeing the private market valuations correct, but there is a lot more to happen. There's another software company called Snowflake, which is in public markets. This was the very hot IPO darling of the tech sector, very high growth business, but that stock is down 47%. Its nearest competitor is a private company called Databricks, which is also looking to go public, but has only reduced its private market valuation by 18%. So we still have this dichotomy between public market and private market valuations, and it makes it harder for private companies, honestly, to attract talent to come work for them if you do not have a reset in valuations. As well as as the cost of capital has gone up, I think it increases the moat around public companies. Uh, We own a company called Nice Systems uh, in our portfolios. It's a contact center software company. And it's been around for a very long time, extremely profitable, 20% free cash flow margins. And it's private companies are actually not private. There are private companies like Genesis, but its biggest competitor is a company called Avaya, which is flirting with bankruptcy. So as the cost of capital has gone up, I think it works to the advantage of some of these more mature public market companies and to the disadvantage of the private market companies, because I think the competitive mode increases, market share gains will accrue to the public market companies because they have the capital at their fingertips to deploy when times get tough. And so that's, I think, uh, to the advantage of public markets. And just a point of clarification there, the the stock that Sonu's just mentioned is not held in the steady hand global small cap equity portfolio, but it is held in some of the other Times Square strategies more on the U.S. side than on the global and international side. Now, Sonu, before we sign off here, and I want to get your perspective on, on some of the things that you're really thinking about today. And I'm not talking about you know, stocks in specific, but I'm talking about some of the issues that are, are top of mind right now as you look at your universe of technology companies and what you're really spending more time thinking about today, given the, the type of environment we're in. Right. So I think Times Square has this investment philosophy, which focuses on um, a couple of things from a qualitative perspective. One is we, we spend a lot of time assessing management quality. And the second is evaluating business models. And what we're looking for is companies where management teams' interests are aligned with shareholders, who have a track record of performance and are good capital allocators. And in terms of business model evaluation, what we look for is companies that have large competitive moats around their businesses, you know, have some sort of sustainable competitive advantage. And then that boils down to sort of the financial performance of the company that we're looking at. So this investment process that Times Square deploys with this quality lens that we have actually helps us during turbulent market environments in shaping a portfolio that tends to be more defensive than the general growth portfolios. So our focus is just making sure that the companies that we own in the portfolios 
meet that criteria. And if right now it's a lot of are our companies price setters or price takers? It's an inflationary environment. We want to be invested in companies that have pricing power. We want to be invested in companies that can be relatively recession resilient because, as we said, the monetary policy works for the lag, and we're worried about a you know investors and analysts are worried about an impending recession next year. So that's just making sure that we're investors in the highest quality names, names with free cash flow support, names that have pricing power and are relatively recession resilient. That's been the focus um, at Times Square. Well, Sonu, we'll have to leave it there. Um, Thank you so much for letting me record this type of conversation that we usually have um, without it being recorded, but uh, I think it'll be really useful for those watching today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.